All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Pop-Up Institute Beyond the Future of Work, New Paradigms for Addressing Global Inequality. Uh, the title for our panel today is Essential for What? A conversation with Sarah Stavano on the global dimensions of essential work. I'm gonna introduce our speaker, the respondents and the idea for the panel in a moment. But first, some basic information on how we're going to run this Zoom meeting. Okay, we made it a Zoom meeting as opposed to a webinar so that our presenters can see the audience during the Q&A. Um, so I would I'd humbly suggest to you that it's optional whether you want your cameras on or off during the talk, but please have them on for the Q&A. It's much easier to talk to people. And while the speakers are talking, please mute yourselves. Um, I think we're all familiar with the vagaries of the mute button on Zoom. Uh, during the panel, you should feel free to type general comments to everyone in the chat. Uh, since we aren't all good multitaskers, and that's particularly true of me, please send any questions for the panelists directly to me. If you'd like to ask a question in person, please put an asterisk at the start of the question. Let me know who the question is for and its general topic. Or otherwise, just during the Q&A, you can use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen and I will call on you. If you're watching from YouTube, uh, enter your questions in your, the YouTube chat and our student team member will pass them along to me. Um, okay, and then just to repeat, when the panelists have finished speaking, please turn your cameras back on for the Q&A. Okay, I, I mean, two years ago, I'd barely heard the term essential work. And now I think it's acquired popular currency in a variety of, if you like, incoherence of meaning. And that's one of the things we're going to investigate in this panel today. I think one of the things the COVID-19 pandemic has done has shaken a foundational pillar of global capitalism, the organization of work. A pivotal dimension of such reorganization has been the uneven classification of work as essential or not. <clears throat> In dialogue with Sarah Stavano, author of, <laughs> we stole the title, Essential for What? A Global Social Reproduction View on the Reorganization of Work During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Respondents will discuss their own research on essential work. Um, and the Rapport Center, part of the idea for this pop-up came from uh, collaborative work that the Rapport Center did in the summer of 2020 with students and faculty at Harvard and Northeastern, where we looked at what were then called early hotspots. Uh, and they were sector or industry specific. So we did research projects on construction work in Austin, uh, meat packing in mostly in Georgia, and um, care work in Boston. And it's interesting that actually two of those are clearly essential work and the status of construction work in Austin is interesting in the sense that it got declared essential after having initially been non-essential. But that summer work, essential work in the time of the pandemic was actually one of the big prompts for this pop-up institute. Okay, first we're gonna hear from our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Sarah Stavano, who is a lecturer in the Department of Economics <clears throat> at SOAS. She's a development and feminist political economist specializing in the study of the political economy of work, well-being, including food and nutrition, households and development policy. Working at the intersections between political economy, development economics, feminist economics and anthropology, she takes an interdisciplinary approach to theories and methods, which is another reason why we're very excited that she's agreed to come and speak to us. Her work fo focuses on Africa with, a pri with primary research experience in Mozambique and Ghana. And you'll hear more about Mozambique, no doubt. Um, so I will quickly introduce our respondents and then hand it over uh, to Dr. Stavano. Uh, first, we will hear from Michelle Dickerson, 
who is the Arthur Almada Chair in Bankruptcy Law and Practice and University Distinguished Teaching Professor uh, at the University of Texas at Austin Law School, and who is our go-to person for the history and legal definitions of essential work. And she's particularly interested in getting those clarified in time for the next pandemic, uh, which is probably coming, but I would really rather not think about it right now. Um, then we will hear from Karen Engel and Sam Tabery uh, on the Austin Project, on the Austin, I'm calling it the Austin Project, it's the project on uh, construction workers in Austin in a time of COVID-19. Karen Engel is the Minerva House Drysdale Regents Chair in Law and founder and co-director of the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center of Human Rights of Justice at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. Samuel Tabery is a PhD student in the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. And then wrapping up our respondents will be Shamala Rudrappa, who is a professor of sociology and director of the South Asia Institute here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and Shamala does extensive work on care work and has written an extraordinary monograph on global surrogacy as a as a as a form of labor and at the sort of oscillating divide between productive and reproductive labor in multinational sites so i'm very excited to hear how she responds to um the paper and sarah stevana's presentation so without further ado sarah the floor is all yours Thank you so much, Neville, for the lovely introduction. And also thank you to you and Karen for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, take part in this conversation. And I think uh, uh, this issue of essential work is quite important. So I very much look forward to listening to the various comments, uh, questions and so forth. Um, so what I'm going to do in this short presentation is the following. I'm going to start by saying a few words about the motivation that led myself and my co-authors to write this paper. Um, then I'm going to provide a brief summary of the paper, so what we did and what we found, the key findings. Uh, and then I'm going to conclude with some brief reflections on uh, the notion of essential work uh, after uh, the first phase of the pandemic, which is the focus of the paper itself. Uh, um, and also, you know, perhaps uh, um, uh, throwing, uh, uh, putting on the table some broader questions in terms of uh, future research on this topic. Um, okay, but so starting with the motivation. So I think it was quite clear from early on in the pandemic that the classification of the workforce into essential and non-essential workers or forms of work was one of the most uh, important dimensions of the reorganization of work during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and therefore I was immediately interested in the topic, but in particular, um, what was quite uh, um, intriguing to me was that when governments across uh, uh, much of the world uh, began to impose uh, the first round of lockdown policies, uh, um, and therefore also uh, they began to use uh, uh, very um, um, sort of powerfully and publicly this terminology of uh, essential work. Um, at least on a superficial level, it seemed that there was a, a fairly wide uh, public acceptance uh, that the notion of essential work uh, and the fact that we cannot define certain work, uh, certain forms of work as essential had uh, some kind of uh, uh, intuitive uh, connotation or a universal connotation to it so that we could uh, somehow immediately understand. And so I was interested in uh, scratching beyond the surface and see whether this uh, universality and this intuitive understanding um, was actually what uh, uh, happened in practice. Uh, um, and second, I think we could probably say that so many governments uh, engaged in uh, some form of a massive operation of uh, rebranding of forms of work uh, that up to that point uh, had been considered uh, unskilled, low-skilled, low-productivity work. And all of a sudden, we realized that actually while uh, 
big chunks of uh, our economies that could be shut down, these forms of work had to continue in order to ensure the basic functioning of economic and social life. Um, and I think particularly from uh, a feminist uh, social reproduction lens, and as Neville mentioned, some of my work uh, is in the area of feminist political economy. So I think very much of these uh, issues from this perspective. Um, it was also clear that not all forms of essential work, but many forms of uh, essential work um, are in fact uh, social reproduction work. So I'm thinking about the sectors of uh, uh, care, healthcare and social care, education, and also the provision of uh, basic public services. Um, and so initially, I must say, I was quite persuaded that, that this uh, operation of rebranding, if we, I mean, we could call it in different ways, uh, but I'm just using this terminology now, um, could be used as a catalyst uh, uh, for the revalorization of forms of work uh, that uh, have systematically been uh, undervalued and devalued in the history of capitalism. Uh, and so this was another motivating factor. Um, although I think I can anticipate already now that I have become less optimistic along the way in conducting this research on essential work. And uh, perhaps I'll come back to this towards uh, the end of the presentation. Um, but so in some, these are the main reasons why I uh, got in touch with my collaborator, Rosalina Ali, who is a researcher based at the Institute of Social and Economic Studies in Mozambique. And at the time I was working with Merle Jamieson, uh, a research assistant. And so I got in touch with uh, the two of them, um, asking if they would be interested in exploring this question on essential work. And we decided collectively to focus on uh, this a uh, broader question on uh, essential for what, um, which if you want to uh, embody uh, um, two uh, concerns uh, that we investigated uh, in the paper. Uh, the first being what is essential work? Uh, so how uh, have these classifications been used? And uh, is this work uh, that serves uh, the primary purpose of reproducing life? Uh, so from a social reproduction perspective, of course, or is it work that serves a variety of purposes, purposes including that of uh, reproducing capital, in fact, and not only life? Um, and secondly, can the essential work terminology uh, provide the basis to reclaim the value of social reproduction work? Um, and so what we did uh, um, uh, was primarily around the three things. So first, uh, we looked at how essential work classifications were used in the first phase of the pandemic, so up to June 2020, so basically a year ago, um, in seven countries uh, across uh, the so-called Global South and Global North. So we looked at Brazil, Canada, England, India, Italy, Mozambique, and South Africa. Um, and uh, second, we explored uh, in general terms, so, so not necessarily focusing in detail on these seven countries, uh, who the essential workers are. And uh, we wanted to keep this into the picture because as we know, um, it was uh, fairly clear that uh, the majority of uh, uh, forms of work classified as essential um, are also low paid uh, uh, jobs or we can also say working class jobs with uh, a concentration of uh, women, uh, people of color or ethnic minorities, uh, depending on context, uh, and migrant workers. Um, and clearly, this is very important to think about the differentiated impacts uh, that the COVID-19 crisis uh, has uh, uh, produced uh, so far, and uh, perhaps they will produce also with uh, lasting effects uh, for the future. Um, and further, so we use a global social reproduction lens, and perhaps I will say a few things later that speak to why we underline the fact that we this adjective global and not only a social reproduction lens. Uh, um, but of course, I'm happy to further expand this in the conversation later on. So we use this lens uh, to reflect on how essential work classifications have protected or not the livelihoods uh, uh, of uh, workers uh, during the first phase of the pandemic. And here we primarily draw on illustrations from Mozambique, which is a country where I have been uh, 
conducting research uh, since uh, 2010. And of course, uh, Rosimina Ali, one of my co-authors, so she's a Mozambican researcher based in Mozambique and her work very much focuses on this country. So perhaps as you can tell from uh, how we formulated our questions and the approach that we took, we have been informed by uh, broadly speaking Marxist feminist approaches. Um, and in particular, uh, social reproduction feminist thinking that is being uh, revived in uh, recent years. Uh, and I think in particular, this lens of social reproduction allows us to see the COVID-19 pandemic as being fundamentally a crisis of work, where work is understood in a feminist sense as including uh, reproductive and productive work. And uh, this in the context of an interconnected global economy, where countries, uh, but also workers within them, are uh, sort of related uh, to one another uh, through relations of hierarchy and dependency that are class, uh, gender, and racialized uh, in uh, various ways. So I think I can say that our findings are primarily two. So the first uh, finding is that uh, despite uh, the um, first glance uh, understanding of uh, the notion of essentiality as having some uh, sort of immediate uh, or uh, intuitive meaning and uh, universal meaning to it, uh, um, the ways in which essential work classifications have been used in the seven countries that we focused on uh, reveal that uh, the meaning of essentiality is much more politicized and fungible than one might have uh, um, uh, uh, first uh, 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 thought of uh, when uh, governments began to use this terminology. Um, and indeed, uh, we did uh, um, a little bit of research also on how uh, essential work uh, uh, language and classifications uh, had been used uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, um, and uh, what we found was uh, a complete lack of consensus uh, over what constitutes an essential forms of work. And indeed, this lack of consensus is uh, <clears throat> then reflected in how these essential work classifications have been used during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so of the 53 uh, uh, essential work categories, uh, that uh, we derived uh, by looking at the classifications used in these seven countries, uh, only 13 uh, were in common across uh, these seven countries, uh, which of course means uh, that, uh, I will first, uh, on the one hand, we know that uh, these notions have been changing over time, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so some types of work have been included and excluded uh, at various stages. Uh, um, but also it means uh, that different countries uh, have uh, considered certain forms of work as essential, while others uh, have not. And so just to give you an example, England uh, did not list uh, cleaning, janitorial and sanitation services uh, as essential. On the other hand, uh, Brazil and Mozambique did not list the uh, carers uh, as essential workers. Uh, and uh, um, uh, another example is that some countries, uh, such as South Africa, qualified uh, what constitutes an essential good, and others, such as England, did not do that, uh, which had uh, very concrete implications uh, for what a company such as Amazon, for example, could do during uh, the lockdown, so what kind of goods uh, they could deliver uh, to people's homes. And uh, in terms of uh, the... Um, political negotiation around the notion of essential work. In Italy, for example, there were explicit and intense negotiations between the government, uh, uh, the representatives of uh, employers and trade unions. And so how these lists uh, were constructed uh, was uh, very clearly the product uh, of uh, these political negotiations. Um, while it was different in the context of Mozambique, uh, which in, where instead the government used a top-down approach and imposed uh, um, a specific uh, uh, essential work classification without engaging in a consultation or an, in a negotiation process. And the other interesting thing about Mozambique is that uh, um, uh, essentially 
almost 70% of the workforce uh, is employed in agriculture. This does not mean that uh, agriculture is uh, the only or the primary occupation, which is quite important, and I will come back to this point later, but um, it means that uh, because uh, anything that has to do with the food production, processing and distribution is considered to be essential, we have the example of a country where essentially two thirds of the workforce uh, are considered to be essential. And I think this raises some questions uh, on what difference it makes uh, when the government has uh, classified uh, two thirds of the workforce uh, as being essential. And I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, but um, so what emerges uh, from uh, this first uh, main finding is that uh, the recourse uh, to the essential work category was intended to ensure the reproduction of life and the reproduction of capital, both to a degree, a degree that reflected uh, relations of power um, between different actors in different ways uh, that materialized and unfolded differently in different countries. Uh, but the question is, uh, can we revalorize uh, the reproduction of human life without uh, uh, reproducing capitalist uh, relations of exploitation and oppression? And uh, here is where a feminist social reproduction lens, uh, which is informed by a focus on a peripheral economy of the global south, uh, such as Mozambique, I think is quite revealing. And uh, to put it in fairly simple terms, uh, I think that one of the main reasons why this perspective is revealing is that in a context uh, such as Mozambique, the fictitious distinction between uh, production and social reproduction is actually quite blurred. And so those dichotomies uh, that we use, uh, particularly in the world of work, uh, distinguishing uh, productive and reproductive work, but also paid and unpaid, uh, formal and informal, do not capture the reality of work uh, in a country such as Mozambique, where the majority of the working population uh, engages in a multiplicity of occupations, um, remunerated and unremunerated work in very complex ways uh, to ensure survival. Um, and I think that this is quite important. And so when uh, we use uh, this uh, global social reproduction lens, uh, we can also get to the second main finding of the paper, which is that essential work classifications, the way they have been used in the first phase of the pandemic, um, have uh, suffered from three key biases. The first is the productivist bias due to the exclusion of unpaid reproductive work from these classifications. The second is a Western bias due to the exclusion or not adequate inclusion, we should say, in certain contexts of informal work which is clearly a very serious omission in a context such as Mozambique, where the vast majority of the working population works in the informal economy. And in Mozambique, this has also unleashed some very perverse mechanisms whereby the government sought to relocate the informal food street vendors in the capital city using public health reasons to do so. And uh, this uh, resulted instead in uh, uh, a complete loss of livelihoods uh, for these workers. Uh, and uh, we should uh, also mention that, uh, um, again, there is an overrepresentation, a concentration of women among informal food street vendors uh, in this context. So, again, there are gender inequalities intersecting with other forms of inequality that matter. The third uh, key bias is a nationalist bias. Uh, due to the exclusion or even here the not adequate uh, inclusion of in particular migrant workers uh, because of the transnational dimensions of the labor process uh, could not be accounted for in uh, forms of uh, regulation and classifications uh, that were designed uh, uh, with the nation state boundaries uh, uh, in mind essentially. And if you want, I can give you some examples of this later. But so in sum, the essential work classifications have recognized that certain workers as indispensable, but have not been used to subvert the relations of power that make these workers disposable. Um, 
so in a sense of, you know, that uh, trade-off between essentiality and disposability uh, was not really resolved uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in, if anything, it was reinforced. And uh, even if the work of essential workers has certainly contributed to reproduce life uh, during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the significant uh, biases and omissions uh, that I have described um, uh, demonstrate uh, that the vast majority of vulnerable workers uh, have not had uh, their conditions of reproduction safeguarded. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and this is clearly what uh, has made me less uh, hopeful on the possibilities of using uh, the language of essential work in order to reclaim the value of certain forms of work that have been uh, uh, long devalued or undervalued. And so just to conclude with some further reflections. Uh, um, yes, so I have become less optimistic for obvious reasons, uh, um, but I do think that there is something in uh, the, the fact that uh, forms of work that were not given uh, social recognition and value um, all of a sudden became uh, so visible and uh, considered to be essential. Um, in a way, there is a part of me that doesn't want to let go of uh, the transformative potential that uh, we might be able to uh, grasp from such uh, transformation, essentially. Although, of course, uh, it is very clear that now, one year and a half into the pandemic, there is no sign that at least I am aware of, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, essential workers are being uh, given uh, increased pay or they are given better working conditions and so forth. So there are, there are no material gains there for essential workers or if anything that they have been uh, more exposed to health risks uh, during the pandemic and so forth. Um, but I think there is something that I would like to focus on going forward, which is whether it might be possible to reframe what we consider to be essential, particularly from a feminist lens, and to really center those forms of work um, that are absolutely necessary for the reproduction of life, although they're often not even considered to be work in the first place. Um, but fundamentally, I think uh, this is a political question. So how uh, politically we might uh, make use uh, of uh, uh, these uh, terminologies and this language, essentially. And uh, uh, reading uh, the report that I think Karen and Sam are going to talk about in a moment uh, on uh, um, uh, Latinx construction workers in Austin, um, I also thought that uh, you know a stronger cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary lens that might be very important because, for example, in my work so far on this, uh, I have not considered any legal perspective uh, on this issue and I'm aware that I am in conversation with uh, scholars in uh, law here, not all of you, but some of you, and uh, reading that uh, report was quite revealing because I could see how different disciplinary lenses that can really add to how we understand this issue. Um, and so, yes, and I think just the very last thought is uh, one that um, as much as I have not uh, continued to research this, uh, the use of essential work uh, terminologies and classifications in a systematic way post June 2020, I do have a sense that uh, the uh, notions of essentiality have become less prominent perhaps uh, in later phases of the pandemic. Uh, um, and I don't know what the exact reason for this might be, but perhaps uh, uh, it could be linked to the fact that lockdowns have become less restrictive. Um, and so I do wonder whether there is uh, uh, also a question around uh, um, forms of reorganization that produce a temporary effects as opposed to long-lasting ones. Uh, um, and I think uh, these are issues that, that uh, should be further explored. Uh, but hoping that I have not taken too much time, I think I'm going to end here. Thank you so much for listening.
Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a, a great summary and you've put some important and interesting questions on the table for our discussion. Uh, I just want to alert audience members that Dr. Stefano's paper, there's a link put to it in the chat. Um, so read it later. It's well worth your time. But don't read it now because you need to focus on what's happening in front of us. Okay, um, I'm going to go in the order of the program. So first I'm going to ask Michelle Dickerson to be our initial respondent. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. So the paper is terrific to me for a whole host of reasons, but mainly selfishly. Uh, that you are grappling with a lot of the problems, uh, sort of the challenges posed by the term essential that I'm also exploring um, in a paper that I'm working on. So many of the people that have been deemed essential workers in this country are, um, as you mentioned, they're invisible. They were invisible before the pandemic. Hopefully, I think it will be impossible to unsee what we've seen during the pandemic. So we may continue to disrespect them and disregard their needs as was largely the case during the pandemic, but it will be impossible to ignore their um, existence. Um, in terms of the sort of the, the comments that I'll make and also the, the frame that I use in the paper that I'm working on, there were some essential workers uh, that like doctors and RNs, um, who I will not discuss in this paper, largely because they were highly compensated and they largely were treated with respect and dignity uh, throughout uh, uh, the pandemic. Not totally, but more so uh, than the essential workers, the essential frontline workers um, that I'll be discussing. And one of the main differences is they didn't have the economic risk and they didn't have as high of the health risk as the frontline essential workers faced during the pandemic. Um, so one of the reasons I actually started working on this paper was in the month of November, when it was clear that we were going to have at least one and likely more vaccines, uh, Wall Street traders uh, wanted to be deemed essential. They didn't want to be deemed essential for a, a noble reason. They wanted to cut to the head of the vaccine line. So when I talk about the essential workers and sort of the ones that I'm focusing in um, on in, in the paper, it's not them, right? It's not the highly compensated workers that didn't face the same health and safety risk in their workforces that the frontline workers um, faced. So what I'll do is talk a little bit about the demographics of the essential workers, the frontline essential workers in, in the U.S., uh, and I will say that whether we're looking at the workers in the US or in Ghana or in Mozambique, there are some uh, commonalities. Uh, in the US, they often returned to an unsafe workplace where they had to work face to face. Um, so, so whether we're talking about lower income domestic workers in the global south or health, home health care workers in the US, uh, many of them were low paid by US standards, so roughly 11 to $12 an hour US dollars, mostly low, um, mostly the service sector, disproportionately non-white and mostly non-college in the sense that they typically did not have a college degree. Now, one interesting thing about those workers, those uh, uh, frontline essential workers in the US, that also happens to be almost the exact same demographic of the non-essential workers who have been harmed the most economically uh, during the pandemic. Um, so uh, low income service workers uh, of color uh, were the ones that had the highest unemployment rates during and throughout the pandemic. Um, they were disproportionately located in the low wage food service or hospitality sector. That's where most blacks and Latinos, non-college blacks and Latinos in particular were harmed the most. And I raise that to show sort of the odd tension that we have with essential workers. So the good news is if you're an essential worker in the US, your uh, industry was declared to be essential and therefore your work was essential, though you weren't viewed as being essential, um, is you got to continue to earn wages. So the good 
news is you earned wages. The bad news is you had significantly higher health and safety risk, both in your workforce. And then also when you went home, you potentially exposed the people that lived in your household and you and the low wage essential workers, frontline essential workers were more likely to live intergenerationally or at least in crowded um, homes. If you were a non-essential worker, sort of low wage service sector, the good news is you didn't have as high of health risk but you had significantly higher economic risk because you weren't able to earn income. So thinking in terms of how the US decided what work would be um, essential, uh, the way businesses were deemed to be essential was sometimes always politicized, sometimes silly. So like in some states, golf courses were deemed to be essential. Uh, but if you looked at the industries or the sectors in the US or the job uh, or, or looked at them by job task, the federal government and the individual states, the way that they determined essential work in some instance was as scattered as the essential workers that you include on table one of your paper. Uh, but the common theme though, at least I think uh, in the US, both for the federal government and also the states, we were guided by a couple of principles. First what companies will be deemed to provide work that is essential is based on what do we need to do to keep the US economy afloat. And I would say a second part is what do higher income work from home workers need to safely work from home? What do business, and also sort of an answer to your essential for what I would say essential for the US stock market. So which businesses need to continue to operate to make sure that the Dow Jones and NASDAQ remain or go to record highs? And again, strong stock market performance also benefits the stay at home work, the high income stay, the high income work from home employees, because let's be realistic in the US, those are the ones that are largely in the market. Most middle-income Americans, most lower-income Americans don't invest in the stock market. So I would argue there's actually some coherency in the U.S. in terms of how do we decide what work will be deemed essential or sort of to answer your question, essential for what. It's essential um, work that low-wage essential frontline workers performed was interdependent with the work that higher income work from home workers performed because you can't be in your home if you don't have the delivery drivers or the grocery store workers making your life function. Uh, I would argue that the federal government and states essentially performed a cost benefit analysis. They looked at the health risk to face-to-face -face frontline essential workers and decided that those risks were not as large as the benefits we got from allowing high income workers to safely work in their homes. So the reason I'm focusing so much on the stock market is because the industries that had stratospheric performance in the market during the pandemic also coincidentally happened to be some of the ones that were declared to be essential early in the pandemic. So when you look at uh, Walmart and Amazon, their stock prices have soared. Some of them, to answer a question that you posed, Sarah, some of them not only shared the, some of the economic gains with their workers, Home Depot did, for example, and the workers continue to benefit from those gains. Others like Kroger and Target paid pandemic wages early on, but then they ended those wages, but most of them, most of the uh, frontline essential workers have in fact not received any of the enormous stock market gains that their employers have received as a result of the pandemic. We have a tattered U.S. safety um, net, so they're basically told go to work face to face. You probably don't have health insurance. You probably don't have paid leave. So you do get to earn wages, but you may get sick and die. And that's sort of the, I think the cost benefit analysis the government and the states used to decide whether or not someone would be 
um, declared essential. So since Neville is coughing, I think that means I need to be wrapping up here. Uh, the paper I'm working on basically argues that when we have another pandemic, and unfortunately I think we will, as soon as there is a declaration that certain work is essential, we need to have immediately certain default rules to go into place. And the only way that employers can avoid those default rules is to contract around those rules in bargaining with the workers. And I also think we need to consider having an excess profits tax. Uh, we look at the companies that benefited from the pandemic and tax them on the profits that they gained as a result of the pandemic and use those profits to compensate the workers that made those profits possible. So thank you for, I loved reading your paper. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. I think it's really, really interesting to sort of get the US into uh, your case studies. Um, And to actually ask the, the 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 question of who benefits, because I think we also been. I mean, I think a lot of the work focuses on who suffers, um, but I think this focus on who benefits is is extremely useful in the in this designation of essential work. All right, Karen and Sam, are 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 you ready to talk about Latinx construction workers in Austin? Yes. Okay. We won't, we, won't, we won't do it at the same time. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for a few minutes first and then um, tee it up for Sam. Uh, so I want to say, first of all, uh, it's so great to meet you, Sarah, and to get to know your work better. So we need your interdisciplinary lens. Um, and it's, it's great to know that you're interested in ours as well. Um, so uh, as, as Neville mentioned, issues of essential work were really our first entry into thinking about what's become this pop-up. Um, and we were really delighted when we came across your very important piece because a lot of people are thinking and talking about essential work, but I don't think anybody's done the depth and breadth of the research that you all have. Um, and I know I asked you beforehand whether you all would have an opportunity to go into depth in some of the, on some of the other countries um, that you mentioned, and it would be really, really terrific if, if, if you are able to have that opportunity. Um, and even though the US is not one of the countries you explicitly discuss, um, as Michelle just made very clear, um, the analysis that you offer um, hits home here as well. Um, and of course, we are a part of global capitalism. So I thought I'd begin by making a few general observations about a few of the contributions of your piece that Sam and I um, really find useful to our project on essential work. Um, and then I'll say more about, about that project. And, and as I said, Sam will pick up from it. So first of all, I think that the mapping that you and your co-authors have done on the historical and contemporary uses of essential work in so many different sites is enormously useful, um, including in thinking about the possibilities for and pitfalls of trying to mobilize around the valorization of essential work. And you, you definitely had more, more of the pitfalls in your discussion today than in the paper, um, but, but it wasn't surprising um, given, given the paper. So, but I appreciate you reminding us of when you talk about how essential work has been used uh, in, in other contexts, reminding us of the prohibitions on strikes um, for essential workers. So essential workers were the workers who were not allowed to go on strike. Um, and of course, I thought if you think about that in terms of, the, of, of trying to valorize the work or make or increase organization among those workers, obviously that would make it quite difficult. Um, but it also then reminded me of the importance of remembering about the essential nature, and I say nature in quotes, but of some of the work that we would agree is quite essential. And so I was thinking about some of the wildcat strikes um, that happened early on in the US in the pandemic, where grocery store workers in particular um, did go on strike for a few days, um, but it seemed that they were able to do that in a way that they would have never they wouldn't have had any power, no power would have come um, from that before, but they were able to do that 
because people saw not just that they were essential, but that they were out doing things that we depended upon. And at that point, not many people wanted to do. Um, so in addition to the mapping, um, I just think you and, and Sam and I have talked about this, that you all really set the stage very nicely for how so many, uh, how workers, so many workers are both essential and expendable and really working through that paradox. And we liked the feminist social reproduction lens that you bring to the table, which he'll say more about directly in a bit, um, as well as the focus on the informal economy and migration, um, both of which are very useful in, uh, in our work. So um, Sam and I are working on a paper, um, which is grows out of the report that you've read and that, that Neville mentioned um, was a part of was a part of the project that Neville mentioned. Um, and the paper is titled right now, Beyond Essential, A Pandemic, Growth, and the Future of Expendable Work in a Progressive, in quotes, boomtown. Um, and we consider the situation of low wage, largely undocumented Latinx construction workers, although we really probably should say Latino for reasons that I'll say, talk about in a minute, um, in the Austin region, who were deemed essential by the state of Texas during the pandemic. And we do so to consider the distributive and racialized effects of a specific brand of growth politics found in this, again in quotes, progressive boomtown. And the paper centers around two moments and I'll discuss the first one and, and Sam will discuss the second. So the first is that early in the pandemic, um, local government in the Austin region had actually shut down most construction work. Um, but it didn't last long because um, after a week, the state of Texas declared all construction work, so commercial, residential, um, just declared it all essential. And it did so based on its reading of the term critical infrastructure, um, which was in the federal documents that many people were following. Many, many local entities and state entities were, were following and reading quite differently um, in terms of declaring what was essential. Um, and it's predicted that the decision by Texas um, to declare that work essential led to construction workers being five times more likely than other workers to be hospitalized for COVID-19. Now, the paper very much fits your findings with regard to the workers who are both deemed uh, essential and made expendable. And also, um, it shows that essential work designations are um, fungible, but very, very political, as you just said. Um, and so, but we thought we'd focus on some of the ways in which our case also seems like an outlier. Um, although one of, that's one of the questions we have for you is whether or not it really is. So um, first of all, it definitely falls into the category of being deemed essential, um, not to reproduction or livelihood. So those you want in the category at the end, um, but to capitalism in ways that you and Michelle have already discussed. Um, and to growth itself. So again, around that critical infrastructure designation. Um, that said, the work in, is that, that the work is construction seems to be an outlier based on your table, um, where civil construction um, was deemed essential in only three of your countries. And the broad sweep of Texas's <laughs> declaration um, of residential and commercial work as essential doesn't appear. So it would just be interesting to think about um, maybe what other work that was deemed essential is, is how other work that was deemed essential might be similar. Um, in any event, the workers are not and never were valorized, even rhetorically, in the ways that many of the frontline workers you and, and Michelle discuss are. And in fact, they're pretty invisible. Um, that's, you can be invisible and valorized at the same time. But, so I, I understand that, but, um, and, uh, and, and they were also made uh, quite precarious as a result of many legal rules um, from immigration to taxation and procurement. Um, but as Michelle mentioned, they were in some ways better off than those who were not <coughs> individual. And in fact, when we interviewed workers, it was very striking that when we asked them what they feared most, we expected to hear about COVID, um, but loss of work was actually what they seemed most concerned about. Um, okay, so um, the other two points I'll just make very quickly. So although we're in the global north, 
So this is on the outlier. Um, perhaps many of the workers we discuss are in fact operating informally. So that's not unique to the global South. Um, and Austin is home to almost 70,000 construction workers, many, many of which are low wage and mainly done by undocumented Latino workers um, from Mexico and Central America. They line up, many of them line up in the mornings at large home repair stores, um, are hired on a daily or if they're lucky, lucky longer project basis. And although they have some legal protections against wage theft, for example, in principle, um, many are reluctant to claim them because of their undocumented status. So um, we have a city that's literally built through informal work. Um, and then third, and perhaps this is related, um, definitely related to the first observation um, about essential for what, the work is gendered, but of course here it's gendered as mostly male. Um, and so that's the Latino. Um, construction is like most work highly segregated in terms of gender. And so I really appreciate your pushing us to think about that more and um, think about how, well, the, like the lens of social reproduction you bring so um, highlights so well many aspects of low wage and unpaid work by women. Um, we want to think about its broader utility. Um, uh, so how we might think social reproduction differently. Um, and uh, maybe for that, with that, I just turn it over to Sam. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, and thanks both Michelle and um, Sarah for your excellent presentation. So I'm just gonna quickly offer some interjections building on what Karen's discussed and then hopefully we can pick some of the themes back up in, in conversation as, as they may or may not be interesting. But um, just to set a little bit more of the stage in terms of Austin being a pro-growth boomtown, um, another key moment that we look at in the report, in addition to what Karen was mentioning about the essential work designation for construction workers, um, is a debate about a decision that was taking place just a few months later after that decision to, to designate all construction workers essential, wherein local officials um, were making a decision on whether they would provide millions of dollars in tax incentives to attract a major electric vehicle manufacturing facility from Tesla specifically um, to the region. And, and they were doing this and they ultimately did approve the incentives even as local funds um, being made available by the city of Austin and Travis County for pandemic emergency release or, or response efforts um, specifically aimed at low income undocumented workers that had been excluded from state and federal support were proving inadequate um, in the range of tens of millions of dollars in terms of what was being allocated versus what community advocates were saying was actually necessary to meet the level of need in, in sort of the larger urban regional community. Um, and then basically growth politics, we contend, are, are at the center of both of these stories, both the essential work designation, as well as this conversation about sort of the allocation and priorities for allocating resources amidst the pandemic. Um, and, and as Karen was mentioning, a, a key part of sort of the contribution that Sarah's piece and, and her co-author's contributions that, that we're finding particularly generative as we're thinking through this is the social reproduction framing. Um, and, and of course, with respect to the case of Latinx construction workers in Austin, there are relationships to be traced at, at the household level, thinking about various configurations of possible households um, of the workers we spoke with, some living with nuclear families, other arrangements that were sort of more roommate arrangements or sort of more hybrid arrangements, all with a variety of work taking place outside of the home um, by multiple members of the household or living situation on some on more permanent basis, some on more intermittent basis. Um, but also with many of the respondents providing ongoing support via remittances to immediate or extended families in the countries of their origin. Um, so all of this sort of creating a complex web of work that goes into the reproduction of the family, of the household unit, sort of both near and far. So, so those connections I think are there and palpable, um, but perhaps where we sort of have the most work that we're interested in sort of still further exploring and maybe we can talk about in this conversation is thinking about sort of the collective and public institutions of social reproduction and social provisioning, specifically at the urban regional scale. So this is not thinking about the household scale or the individual family unit scale, but the public institutions that support those other sort of more household or family unit scales. Um, so this could be thinking about housing, about social safety nets, about healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And, and so as part of a larger understanding of Austin as a boom town, wherein there are active incentives and investments being made in corporate welfare and well-being and profitability via a range of subsidies, both obvious and less obvious, um, we're also trying to think through how sort of the politics of the progressiveness of that boom town on which much of its boominess, so to speak, might be premised. Um, how could that be altered in ways that, that make possible investments in institutions of social reproduction and social infrastructure at these wider systemic scales? And whether that should be part and parcel of the same conversation of household social reproduction, sort of disciplinary language, and, and what it means to put those conversations in, in, in explicit interaction with one another. Um, overall, basically thinking about not just the range of investments needed at the urban regional scale, um, but also taking into account, as we were saying, sort of the transnational scales of connection and linkage um, that are also very present in the lives, particularly of, of undocumented immigrants. Um, and, and ultimately, this is building sort of to the final point, basically. So if we're in a context where the governor has made it clear that there is a degree of essentiality around both growth, growth excuse me, and construction work that undergirds that growth in Texas, sort of in service of the um, larger Texas economy and sort of capitalist reproduction. Um, and, and in the case of Austin, wherein part of its positionality as a boomtown is premised on a regional political economy in which systemic investments in social reproduction are in fact not being made at the level that Karen and I, and, and in fact, many, many sort of progressive advocates or observers in the Austin region would say are, are not necessary, or are, excuse me, are not at the levels that need to be necessary. Um, how should we think about the political shifts that would be necessary to get us to a place where we can make those investments at that larger urban regional scale? Um, and it's this paradox. So that is any of this even possible in a world where growth remains understood as essential? Um, or do we need sort of a, do, do we require basically a more severe break, a, a severe pivot to new paradigms um, in, in the sense that, that can workers as essential be valorized when growth is the essential sort of critical infrastructure in which they're operating in support of. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there, but, but hopefully that provides some, some additional points that we might be able to pick up. But um, thanks very much again for the presentation. I guess I should just jump in, Neville. Sure, I'm sure gonna take it, bring it home, bring us home, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah and your co-authors uh, for you know, uh, this really lovely piece of work that you've done uh, and really centering again, you know, social reproduction and its centrality at some level to the entire economy, right? Uh, a couple of points I wanted to make, um, there were some more, but let me focus on two that I would really like to build on from your work, uh, is really thinking about migration, not just transnationally, but also internal migrations. And then thinking about the massive crisis that India faced in its first wave of COVID infections when the Modi government shut down the country, right? Uh, and that is when you realize how critical social reproduction was for these workers, because all of these migrant workers in cities like Bangalore, Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta had nowhere to go uh, because the places that they worked at shut down. There was no ways by which they were getting wages, no food, no place to stay. And there was this massive migration from urban areas back into rural areas where these mostly men came from, right? And no transportation as well. So you had these horror stories and these visuals of people dying on the roads as they were walking back hundreds of miles back home with not even water, right? So I think at some level that really at some level highlights uh, not just paid, you know, social reproduction uh, labor that, you know, goes into social reproduction, but also the vast amount of unpaid labor that goes into social reproduction of workers itself, right? Um, and I think at some level that simply highlights the work that you're doing, the example that I bring in here. Um, you know, so thank you for, you know, at some level highlighting that in your work. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is, um, I think we should be very careful in terms of not thinking that just because someone is an essential worker, that they're not disposable. 
disposability is, and essentiality at some level get tied together very intrinsically, right? And we don't need to think about this as necessarily high wage workers as being indisposable and low wage workers as indisposable. And I bring this point up to think about what is ha happening in healthcare in the US today, right? Um, so, many, so much of our healthcare is privatized. Our hospitals are privately owned. And at precisely, precisely because of the pandemic, um, you see massive loss of revenue for hospitals. So people who've gone in for, you know, would have gone in for uh, various kinds of health interventions actually didn't go to the hospitals uh, because of the pandemic. But at the same time, there were other kinds of expenditures hospitals had precisely because of the kinds of COVID interventions that they needed to do. So there was massive loss of revenue for hospitals, right? And the ways by which hospitals and companies, uh, healthcare companies, have tried to recuperate these costs is actually put the onus on the worker. And these are uh, doctors, these are nurses, uh, whether they're registered nurses or LVNs or medical technicians, right? Um, it is not surprising then that at the height of the pandemic, you actually start having hospital closures, especially across uh, rural parts of the country, right? Um, this is also a moment, I think, that you start seeing even healthcare being reorganized in particular ways. Um, and I focus on healthcare because it, these are seen as essential workers. And I saw, um, you know, this, this lovely comment uh, that Nina had put in, in the uh, comments saying, are we talking about essential workers or essential work? And I'd really like to maintain that distinction, right? Uh, because workers, once again, centers people rather than processes. And what we're starting to see is there's a focus on essential work rather than essential workers, right? And let me say why I'm saying this. Um, again, I'm thinking about medicine. Um, there's this project that I'm doing with a couple of colleagues of mine uh, in our uh, care work cluster, where we're starting to see the growth of telemedicine, right? Um, and there's all of this excitement about telemedicine as the ways by which um, people are going to be safe, feeling safer, going to have doctor's visits because of the remoteness. Doctors are going to feel safer as well. So you can do medicine as usual, right? Without exposure to these germs, so on and so forth. Telemedicine is also being used as, or posited as the savior for rural healthcare. So as you start seeing hospitals being shut down, uh, right now, 56% of the rural hospitals in Texas are at the, um, are at the threat of being shut down because of loss of revenue, right? So at this point in time, you start seeing telemedicine growing and saying, you don't need to have doctors and nurses at the site, right? That instead you could do telemedicine and various other centers like Austin actually taking care of patients, right? So there's a way by which you start seeing even what we think of as essential work, healthcare, as being restructured in particular ways and increasing then worker vulnerability. So I'd really like for us to think about this as essential work versus essential workers and thinking about what this means, right? Uh, I guess I'm so much more of a pessimist than at some level uh, than, you know, maybe I share with you your pessimism, um, you know, um, in, in these, in what's to come, I guess. Um, but that's all I had for comments. And I just was hoping to have more of a discussion with all of you uh, regarding these processes. Okay, fantastic. Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, <clears throat> all right, Sarah, do you want to pick which... We've got a lot on the table here. So do you want to pick which ones feel most urgent to respond? And then I'm going to give the panelists, you've actually, you've all done very well and stayed at the time. So thank you. So I'm going to give the panelists like, you know, give Sarah a couple of minutes to respond and then give the panel 10 minutes or so to talk to each other 
and then I will open it up for questions. All right, Sarah, it's all yours. Great, thank you. So yes, I will just uh, pick up on a couple of points, but let me say that uh, uh, this is wonderful. So thank you so much for all of your comments. Uh, it's really very interesting. And I hope if we can stay in touch uh, uh, beyond this uh, uh, exchange today, actually. Um, but yeah, just a couple of things. So I was very struck by what Michelle said on, we cannot unsee what we have seen during the pandemic. And I think that there is a truth in this. Uh, um, I can really see it. Uh, and I do hope uh, that uh, this will be the case uh, in some ways. I mean, of course, we've seen a lot of uh, horrible things, unfortunately. But I think in terms of recognizing the uh, essentiality, uh, the critical importance of certain workers, I think that this is important. Uh, um, at the same time, linking this uh, with uh, what uh, Karen and Sam were saying about uh, uh, their own study of construction workers, uh, I think there is something interesting around the, the relationship between essentiality and visibility. And I do think it's true that not all workers uh, who have been defined as essential have been uh, made visible in the same way during the pandemic. So I do think that there is a question worth exploring, which is, uh, yes, it is probably true that we cannot unsee what we have seen, but then we need to um, find out what we have seen actually, because there might uh, be things that we, we have not seen properly <clears throat> and uh, we need to be mindful of that. So this new hierarchy uh, that immediately emerge uh, even among essential workers, uh, um, are uh, quite important. Uh, and of course, uh, that uh, um, broader notion of uh, who are the winners uh, and uh, what we can learn about essential work by thinking not about the losers uh, only, but also about the winners, uh, which I think is fundamental. Um, and then uh, secondly, on uh, Sam's point about the sites of social reproduction and thinking about the social reproduction, not only in households, but also at a wider systemic level. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, this is my understanding of social reproduction as uh, being composed by a multiplicity of uh, forms of work and practices that take place uh, uh, at various scales, uh, including in households, uh, in communities and in institutions. So, so I think that that is fundamental. And in terms of though, on how, what we, can we do in order to make that shift happen, which is of course uh, the most important question. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I think it's a political issue here. Um, and I think that the work that the feminist scholars have been doing in uh, uh, talking about uh, the systemic uh, crisis of social reproduction and how the constant squeeze on social reproduction over time uh, during uh, uh, the history of capitalism is uh, unsustainable. Um, and I think that there is something in making that shift happen that uh, uh, is linked to be able to make uh, this point uh, that uh, we cannot uh, continue to constantly squeeze uh, uh, social reproduction in the ways that we have done, uh, which of course uh, connects uh, with uh, what Sharmila was also saying uh, um, about uh, uh, disposability and essentiality and the importance of uh, unpaid work. Uh, um, uh, and yes, I, I can uh, very much uh, hear your point on uh, maintaining a distinction between essential work and workers. Actually, interestingly, in the classifications that we have looked at, uh, this was indeed uh, a difference uh, uh, among countries. So with some countries uh, making reference uh, to workers in specific sectors, so more of uh, 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 reference to workers. Uh, and others instead of providing lists of uh, activities uh, considered to be essential, but not uh, with explicit uh, reference uh, to people working in uh, those sectors. Um, but yes, I think that's it. Uh, uh, I think let's have a discussion all together. Thank you. All right, I mean, I, I'm gonna, mildly abuse my position as moderator. Because um, there were two, I, 
I know, I know Karen and Sam and Michelle have lots of opportunities to talk to each other, but I think it might be interesting to have that conversation around this particular issue be public. Um, so Karen and Sam in the Austin report, you're arguing that actually construction worker construction work was designated essential because it was essential for growth. Um, and that, I mean, and that completely complicates our a, a socially reproductive understanding of essential work. And I mean, I think one can do that quite, one can see the cynical politics in that. And then Michelle, I think you actually took it one step further that actually you said it's a, the, the designation of essential work was what work was essential for the stock market. Am I remembering that moment correctly? Um, <clears throat> so how, how, how would you put those two, in a way kind of, I think quite broad um, and probably correct, um, designations of essential work that actually have got very little to do with uh, the reproduction of everyday life. So I guess I'll sort of jump in on the work versus worker. I don't think that the federal, well, I don't, not that I don't think, the federal government never cared about workers, nor did the states. Uh, when you look at the CISA, the list that was provided, uh, created by the Department of Homeland Security, they designated industries or sectors, not workers. And sort of to, to somewhat respond to, to Neville's point, I don't think that we cared whether or not a human or a robot stocked the shelves at Walmart or delivered your Amazon package to your front door if you were working from home. The goal was we need that box delivered. So it is the task that we viewed as essential, not the worker because if they could have replaced the worker, the Amazon driver with a drone, everybody would be fine as long as that box is delivered and the work from home people can continue to safely produce income at home. Okay, maybe I'll just jump in. Um, so, and, and Sam, you can add, because we actually, we have discussed this and gone back and forth looking at those CISA regulations, um, because sometimes they do refer to the people who do the work, but it's pretty <laughs> clear um, that the focus is on the work. And I, I mean, one of the things that, so the paradox about being essential, but also expendable, I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a paradox once you say we only care about the work, right? Um, and I think as Sarah says at the end of her paper, I mean, it's also an assumption, maybe because of the type of work that there is a reserve, or definitely because of it, that there's a reserve army of labor. And then you add to that the pandemic conditions um, and the number of people out of work um, that makes it even more so, which is in real tension then with other kinds of um, assistance, right, that's being given uh, to allow people to stay out of the workforce. And so, I mean, I, and, I, and I haven't gone to being this cynical yet, except it doesn't take much, right? So who wasn't eligible for those federal funds? Um, not surprisingly, those were largely undocumented workers um, and even, even some documented workers, but um, mostly undocumented workers. And cities and counties stepped in in some situations, like they did a bit in Austin and Travis County, to provide funds for those workers, but not enough to take away the, the need to work. Um, so I think, I mean, but it is interesting because I, I think we get something out of the paradox. So if we're thinking about political strategy, we get something about play, working through the paradox and focusing on how essential the workers themselves are, but, and then can't quite understand why they're expendable unless we put the kind of, um, Marxist analysis on it, but uh, but again, you can use that same analysis to see how 
how the paradox goes away once you focus on work. So I, I don't know which is the best move strategically. This is a little bit of an unformed thought, but just the the given that the the CISA or the home the the Department of Homeland Security designations around critical infrastructures as sort of the sectors work in support of which is essential and therefore the workers who do that work are essential following that chain of things makes me think about the um whether there's something generative about the notion of infrastructure being at the heart of that the the, the notion of critical infrastructure being at the heart of that given that um sort of in conversations about infrastructure it's it it, it it's not always obvious to say what it is but you do you, it's not you know what infrastructure is when you see it, but it's you know what infrastructure is when it fails. Um, and if you notice that it failed in your life, then that was something infrastructural that you hadn't previously seen. Um, and so this question of visibility and that which can't fail or that we literally can't conceive of failing without things not being able to go on as normal, I think is interesting when we connect it with the notions of growth and with the stock market, frankly. Um, and, and if we, this isn't like a particularly novel, um, recognition, but just the idea that those have become such central forces that we literally can't conceive of not centering them in sort of a national public policy discourse. Um, and I don't even know how much would have been different had we been operating under an entirely different sort of political administration. Um, those questions of economy and growth um, might well still be quite centered. But but the infrastructural aspect of, of knowing it when it fails seems like a relevant part of this conversation that, that could be joined up with the essential um, designation. Can I jump in, Sam? Sam, you said something interesting about infrastructure, and I was thinking, would that also make um, IT workers, right, information tech workers essential as well then? I mean, even think about our ability to do Zoom, right? You can think about those people doing code, so on and so forth, that make this uh, possible where they're not necessarily migrant workers, but they're probably sitting in the Philippines and in India you know, uh, Israel, Ireland, doing code and making this possible. Um, I don't know, there's, you know, when you said infrastructure, I couldn't help but think about IT workers who perhaps may not even be within the US, but are so essential then as essential workers to the US, right? How then does one think about that? Well, on, some, on some of the list, actually, IT work was listed as essential work. So whether the workers were deemed essential or not, they were listed as essential work. And I want to follow up on actually something that Sam said that I thought you were going to say, Charlotte. Hmm. We, we're having this whole argument now with infrastructure over whether or not caregiving is in fact infrastructure. Well, we certainly saw during the pandemic that caregiving is essential because if, if, if parents don't have a place for their children to be cared for, nothing works. So that's the failure, I think, that, that Sam was talking about. And second, I would say, no one noticed how important K-12 education is in terms of A, providing care so that parents can earn income, and B, for feeding children who otherwise would be um, uh, hungry, right? So we noticed a couple of things that failed um, spectacularly, we may not want to call them infrastructure, and we may fight over whether or not they should be deemed as infrastructure, but there was a clear failure. And again, going back to my point, we cannot unsee what K, the role of K-12 um, education is in the lives of workers because of the colossal failure we just saw during the pandemic. Michelle, I think you're so much more hopeful about we cannot unsee what we have seen because if anything we know, you know, people have short memories, politics, politicians have very even shorter memories. I mean, right, uh, we're constantly forgetting what it is that we see. Uh, if anything, you know, I don't know. There's the images of violence that, you know, that for example, we see in war, for example, we forget that, right? Um, so I think there's ways by which we're constantly, very quickly unseeing what we have actually seen. So I would actually differ with you. I mean, you know, differ from you on that point. Well, I guess my response is, I'm not optimistic that we're necessarily going to fix all of the problems that we saw, but we can't go forward and say, well, I mean, really how important is caregiving? You're gonna to have to change and say, 
caregiving may be important, but we're still not going to pay the, ca pay the caregivers what they should be paid. But we can no longer make the old argument, well, how important can caregiving be? Because we've seen it. And I guess the, the, the one thing that makes me somewhat hopeful is given that we're in the month of June and in the US, we know the horror of last June for us with the George Floyd and sort of the racial reckoning People couldn't unsee what we saw during the month of June. We haven't had tremendous progress in terms of where I would like the progress to be, but Derek Chauvin was convicted, right? So again, in two years, we may go back to the, you know, the same problems that we've had, but we'll have to at least come up with another argument for why we were okay with low wage frontline essential workers being mistreated, but we can't say it's because they're not essential. All right, we have nine minutes left. I'm not being flooded with private chest questions in the chat. There are a couple of, I think, very important uh, public questions and comments. So I think let's, let's do it with the hand raise. If you have a question, um, <clears throat> Sherry, do you wanna ask your questions in person or shall we just ask the panel to read the chat? Okay, maybe Sherry's dead. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, There's a new one on the chat. What if uh, we are waiting for people to maybe type in their thoughts or uh, can I say something in the meantime? Yes, of course, yes. Yeah. So I think on the issue of infrastructure, uh, Yes, I mean, of course, uh, there is this uh, uh, debate that I think is gaining some momentum that Michelle was referring to on uh, uh, extending the notion of uh, infrastructure beyond physical infrastructure. So I think Sherry was asking in the chat so whether uh, probably in the table in our paper, what infrastructure means. So in that, constant, in that context, it means only physical infrastructure. Uh, but I think that, uh, something is moving in terms of uh, uh, extending what we understand as infrastructure as including also social infrastructure. And uh, a little bit, I think it connects to basically how we can uh, um, uh, formulate a political claims uh, to make sure that we cannot unsee what we have seen, to quote you, Michelle, again. Um, it's not about uh, expecting that anything will happen automatically because uh, certain things have happened, but it's about uh, using this knowledge in order to make political claims. And I think that this ties into also that notion that uh, Sharmila was talking about uh, on uh, how disposability and essentiality are very much uh, interconnected, which I completely agree with. Uh, um, and for me, the question is, uh, therefore, not how through essentiality alone we can uh, get rid or diminish disposability, but how through the visibility that might be gained through essentiality, we can formulate a political claim that help us uh, um, uh, diminish uh, or uh, erode disposability. Um, but it's all about, uh, the way I see it is all about the formulation of uh, political and economic arguments as well um, that can be won uh, where they should be won, basically. Uh, yeah. I don't know if there was something else in the chat, or but... Okay, Sarah, uh, Sarah Orleans Reed, please. I was going to say identify yourself, but hey, please feel hey. free to talk. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. And I, I found uh, Dr. Stefano's paper a few months ago when we were first um, kind of diving into this, this area of, of essential work on research that um, my organization, Women in Informal Employment, um, Globalizing and Organizing, is doing on informal workers, mostly in the South. 
um, and just found the paper was just extraordinarily helpful um, in, in kind of understanding what we were seeing. And so, so thank you for that. Um, I, I just wanted to share that um, our work has focused on um, four groups of, of workers, uh, as I said, mainly in the South, um, street vendors, uh, domestic workers, uh, re informal recyclers or waste pickers, and um, home-based workers who produce in their homes. And of that group, what we found was that um, by and large, the only ones in, in, in this, the countries that we were studying who were declared to be essential were uh, street vendors, basically, and, and only those who were providing food. Um, and even that, which seems so obvious because uh, street informal food vendors play such an important role in food system and in feeding households, um, the, even those groups, that, that was like a, a big political claims making process that they had to go through. Um, and so in a sense, it did kind of uh, support the theory of revalorization on, on paper, at least, because for the first time, these workers who are, you know, as Dr. Stefano pointed out, being removed from public spaces, even during the pandemic, were, you know, were, were called essential, were recognized in this way. But what was what was interesting is that when we actually looked at who was able to work, um, whether be, mostly because of city restrictions or because of, of policing activities, um, those workers who were declared essential at the beginning of the lockdown, these street vendors and market traders were by and large less able to work than groups who were not seen to be essential um, among informal worker groups. Um, and that. Uh, you know, we think that we think that that is I, in in this group. You know, that it, it's made me think about how um, this connection between while this this group is clearly providing essential life sustaining services, they weren't really doing anything to support capitalist growth. Um, and in fact, they're they're often deemed to be contrary to the goals of um, of capital in in global cities where we're doing this research. Um, so that that this was a this was a helpful conversation um, to to formulate that uh, a little bit more. Um, uh, but yes, I do think that there's I, I think it's important to look at not only who was declared essential, but in these contexts where the declaration didn't necessarily match the reality to see what happened on the ground. So thank thank you again for this conversation. Can I quickly say thank you to Sarah for sharing this? So it's very interesting, actually. And I'm familiar with the uh, work by Diego and I'm a fan of it, actually. Um, and yeah, I think you said a lot of uh, very important things, uh, including uh, thinking about uh, not only how classifications have been formulated, but how they have produced different implications, so whether directly or indirectly. And I think that this is very important for contexts uh, where the reality of work is so complex, uh, uh, because exactly economic informality is very widespread, and uh, because of uh, the absence of uh, regular employment opportunities. Uh, um, which, uh, in fact, I can connect uh, to one thing that I pr probably briefly touched upon in the presentation, but I want to further underline, which is how, in the context of peripheral economies, uh, what matters is not only uh, informality, but it's really this idea of uh, multiple occupations yeah. and uh, the realization that, uh, uh, you know, even if we're able to come up with a very clear uh, 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 essential work uh, classification, it is very likely that some people uh, will be at the same time uh, essential and non-essential workers, uh, right? Or engaging in forms of essential and non-essential work. And I think that the essential work classification so far have been a complete, I mean, this is a complete blind spot. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a massive limitation in contexts uh, where these realities are so complex. Um, yeah. I'll leave it there. Well, I mean, I think these realities are so complex uh, <clears throat> is a good final word um, for this panel. So I would just like to thank Dr. Stefano. That was really wonderful. And Michelle Dickinson, Karen Engel, Sam Tabriam, Sh Shamna Rudrapa. This was a very thought provoking uh, an exciting session. I wish we could have pulled a little bit more of the optimism 
uh, that was in the initial paper, but I think that was the first stage of the pandemic. And we've had a year of actually seeing the ways in which essential workers became more fungible and disposable. Um, so thank you, everybody. Check, keep coming. Um, check the program. Uh, we have like tomorrow and then great public events next week and a wrap up the following week. So I hope to see as many of you there as possible and virtual applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much.